Hi. So I would like to um, introduce Chris Gillibo to everyone. He has been a source of inspiration for me in my life for at least the last five years. Over at The Art of Nonconformity, he blogs all about living a remarkable life. And I'm super excited to share your philosophy as well as your life experience with all the people that are tuning in. Because I, I feel like out of all of the books that I've read, probably hundreds of books and w retreats that I've attended, workshops, um, papers that I've read, your work on living and creating and sharing your work with the world has, has been the piece that feels most actionable to me. And one mm -hmm. of the things I really appreciate about how you do life is that it's it gets really actionable. Like the, the intersection of goals and service is really something that I find inspiring. And I think a lot of other people tuning into this will be really inspired. So thank you. Thank you. That's a huge honor and great introduction. Thank you, Gemma. You're welcome. So I want to just open up by by sharing a little bit about the, the art and science of designing a life you love is really about consciously engaging with personal truth and then allowing that personal truth to be expressed out into the world. And um, the whole concept of living a remarkable life, I think, is intertwined with this idea of of personal truth. So I'd love to hear about your your perception on life design. I know it's not a, a kind of a collection of words that you use, but I feel like when I'm observing you living your life, you're really consciously engaging with your personal truth. Sure. And designing your life the way you want it to be instead right. of the way others expect it to be. Yeah, I mean, life design, life planning, living with intentionality, you know, I feel like it's somewhat semantical, you know, which term or whatever we use. So I, I certainly try to live with intention. Um, I do try to create the life that I want and align things around that. Um, and I've always pretty much done that for better or worse. Uh, I don't know that I've always been super successful at it, but I guess I've always had an independent desire. You know, I've always like wanted to do things my own way and I've wanted to um, just kind of find a way to make that happen, right? You know, like even in, in entrepreneurship, I like this, um, this definition that says an entrepreneur is someone who will work 24 hours a day for themselves to avoid working one hour a day for someone else. Yeah. So it's not always the smartest thing in some ways, right? But as soon as I heard that, I was like, that's totally me, right? <laughs> that is me. Like, I, I want to do things my own way. I will fight for it. You know, I will change circumstances. I will, I will take on any challenge, you know, as long as it's going to bring me closer to that goal, again, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. No. Have you have you always been like that, or or did, have you ever found yourself in a moment in life when you you felt like you were living someone else's life, or have you always just lived life on your own terms? I think I have almost always lived life on my own terms, but in saying that, I have to qualify it a bit because it I don't want it to sound again like I've always been successful at it, um, mm -hmm. or that it's always gone super great. Um, but no, I don't think I've ever tried to live someone else's life. I think that's really exhausting. You know, like I think like trying to be someone that you're not is is really hard. I mean, I, I probably can think of some times not where I was living someone else's life, but maybe where I attempted to do something that really just did not feel great. Yeah. You know, um, like I, I never really had a full time job, but I did have a few part time jobs before I kind of started my own stuff. And I had about a one week job as a telemarketer. Mm -hmm. And I was about one week too long. I mean, I knew pretty much like the first afternoon, if not the first like phone call that I had to make, you know, on behalf of some organization, I forgot even what it was, you know, um, this is when I was like 19 years old. Like I knew it just felt so terrible. It was like, I just can't, and that wasn't even like I was selling something bad or anything. It's just like, I cannot do this. Like I have no idea how to call strangers and try to pitch them on something. It doesn't feel good. Yeah. So there was that not, not feel good sensation yeah. that like, kind of, it sounds yeah. like, yeah. made you jump ship from sure. there. Did you, yeah. So entering into that, was it was it something you're like, this might be my thing, I'm going to give it a shot, or was someone else saying, go get a job? Like, how did you... I don't know. I just, I, I like to do different stuff, and I, I heard about this job, and I thought maybe this will be for me, and obviously it wasn't, you know, and, and I guess fortunately, like, I, I'm a big believer in experimenting, and, and it's not like, you can experiment, you can get a job, you can do, you can try to start a business, you know, and you can do something without a lot of risk and the, the cost isn't super high, you know? So I finally just walked away from that job and never went back, which is basically how everybody else quit too. You know, there wasn't like a two week notice, you know, kind of thing going on. And you know, that's fine. I mean, I, I did later go to grad school and that was also kind of like a, 
oh, maybe I'm living somebody else's life. I mean, it wasn't terrible, but it was kind of like, it's not really making me feel alive. Yeah. You know, I'm not really feeling energized and excited. And I, I did kind of notice, and I believe this is, maybe this is a principle of life design. I'm not sure what you think, but maybe one principle, at least for me, is I'm, I always do a much better job if I'm excited and motivated by the task at hand. It's really kind of hard for me to psych myself up into doing something that I don't enjoy. Yes. So with, with graduate school, was it a, how did you how did you end up in graduate school? What were the sort of conditions that motivated you into, you know, mm -hmm. paying the fees, sending in your application, attending yeah. class? How did you get there? Yeah, okay. So now I'm feeling like maybe I should retract one of my earlier answers because it's causing me to think a little bit because I guess um, the honest answer is I went to grad school because I felt like that's what I was supposed to do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and it was a dream of mine. Like it was something that I wanted, but I guess maybe the root, the root of it was – you know, I want to be successful in this way. I want to per be perceived as an expert or an authority. And therefore, the way to do that is to gain a piece of paper that has initials, you know, behind my name or something that says this is the expert or the authority. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe maybe it's, a, it's kind of a, a two-edged two thing. I did want to do it, but I also kind of felt like that's the way I, I should do it uh, just because that's how it works in society. Yeah. So when, when you found yourself there and like maybe not feeling as energized with grad school as you do with some of your other awesome projects, mm -hmm. by the way, I'm going to stop there for a moment because one of the awesome projects that you're involved with is the World Domination Summit. And I just get like goosebump, tingly, excited, just even mentioning the words. It's um, basically a collection of thousands of people from all over the world coming together that similarly value community adventure and service and so anyone tuning into this check out the world domination summit i suggest it to most of my clients oh great and um and i've been multiple times so um first thank you thank you for that oh please thank you it's a big honor so when Fun. i see you there i know there's a tremendous amount of energy and time and juggling that's required to put on something like that and i imagine grad school is like well, know that grad school is similar mm -hmm. so for you when you found yourself in grad school you mentioned um kind of the motivation that comes with passion and, and with energy. When you were in grad school, I'm getting to my question, what, how did you know that maybe it wasn't 100% for you? I think there are a couple of things. I think what matters in the evaluation of these kinds of endeavors is, number one, your own level of motivation and excitement. Because as I said, I think it's important that, you know, in this day and age, we have so many opportunities and possibilities. Anybody like tuning in to watch this has a certain amount of free time and a certain amount of ability to, to do different things. And they're also probably interested in forging their own life, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, anybody in this situation, why not find a way to do things that we're excited about and motivated by? So that's the first thing. But then I guess the second thing I'm interested in is impact. And like, what is it really making a difference? Right. You know, am I really helping people through this? Do it, does anybody care through this? And... In my experience in grad school, I'm sure there are people who are exceptions, but my experience was, you know, I, I had some friends, I had good peers, um, I, I was learning some things, but I wasn't really doing anything that made a fundamental difference and spent a lot of time in the library, you know, uh, researching papers, hours and hours uh, writing these essays and term papers and things that nobody ever read, or maybe one person read, right? Or maybe best case scenario was like, I'm sharing this in some graduate student forum and there's like 15 people, you know, an audience, right? That's the best case scenario. Like it's not going to, you know, um, it's not going to like change the world. Mm -hmm. Whereas to mention something like WDS or even like the online work that you and I both do, probably some of the viewers do as well. Like we have this chance to like reach so many people like immediately, right? No filter, no gatekeepers, you know, and there's no delay. I mean, there's just so many, it's just, ah, you know, so the difference is kind of like personal motivation impact, right? Yeah. And I didn't feel that in graduate school, either one. Yeah. And doing what I do now, I feel it. Beautiful. What, so part of conscious life design is all about knowing your true self over your false self. So true self mm -hmm. is like the essence of who you are, your truth, all of that. And then the false self is usually something we develop over time. Mm -hmm. um, it's the expectations of others. It's the roles we feel like we should be in. And one element of knowing your true self over your false self is understanding really what your core values are. Mm. So I, I wonder for you, like, what are the core values that cause you to feel lit up by like WDS or some of your other books um, or projects like Pioneer Nation? What is it about those projects that, what are the values of those 
mm -hmm. um, over like grad school, for example. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, the first value to go back to is freedom and independence. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm doing this myself, you know, I'm kind of setting the, the terms or the rules or the parameters or whatever you call that around those things. Like, I'm fortunate to work with great people. Uh, so it's not all me for any of those things, even the books that I write. You know, I have a great team at my publisher and my agents and all those people. But nevertheless, you know, I, I can kind of set a number of parameters and do it my own way. So I guess that's the first thing. And the second thing is just gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an important value. I also like, I'm not sure whether this fits in like one, two, or three, but I, li I like making things. Mm -hmm. I'm really motivated by producing stuff and, and delivering it and shipping it out to the world. And I'm, I'm a list person. I don't know about you, Jim, but I, like, I write everything down and like, I love crossing things off my list. You know, I'm, I'm kind of old school. I have like this notebook that I carry around ever, everywhere with me. Mm -hmm. And it makes me happy to go like with my bench, you know. <laughs> so that's an important value. Yeah. So I've tried to structure my life. Sorry, I'll give you some more. You can cut any of this you want. Um, I tried to structure my life around the continued production of deliverables, you know, because I know that that makes me happy. It makes me happy to go from here's something I'm supposed to do, and now it's done. Yes. Okay. So that leads me into the question about your new book, The mm. Happiness of Pursuit, um, which makes me a little giddy just saying the title. Tell me, tell it, like, tell more about that. Cause I feel like it's, it's intertwined with this concept of like, of all, what your core values are, but also maybe choosing a life that really lights you up over, you know, just kind of not being on the hamster wheel and, and following the path that others expect you to follow. Cool. Yes. Um, so I think one thing I should have mentioned before was adventure. I didn't mention the value of adventure. I think you mentioned it. So thank you. Um, I always like to do meaningful things. I like to explore and discover. And uh, so for a long time in my life, travel has been an important part of it. And I had this personal quest of visiting every country in the world, uh, which came to an end last year. It was about a 10 or 11 year project. And I always knew I wanted to write a book about that. Um, but fortunately the book is not just about my project and my travels because that's kind of boring and everybody has a memoir, you know, um, also I want my books to be successful and most memoirs don't sell very well, you know, so I wanted to do something bigger, right? So, um, I've been studying quests and as part of the process of going everywhere, I was meeting a lot of different people and, and hearing from other people who have undertaken a quest, uh, not just travel quests, but lots of other things as well. And just trying to understand why they do that, why sacrifice, you know, a long period of time and often money and other energy and investment and things that they, they, they have to say no to in order to do this, this quest or this pursuit. Um, why do they do that? What do they learn along the way? How are they changed? And then how can we um, benefit from it? So why should we pursue a quest? Um, and so the book is not just an academic study. Uh, the book has a message. I, I really believe in putting forward a message uh, in my work. And uh, the message is that a quest can bring meaning to your life. And, and a quest is, is something that can bring happiness and purpose to your life. So, so for those people wanting to begin a quest, mm. what guidance would you give them on choosing, again, like a soulful, truthful quest over maybe a quest that some... Because when I hear... I, 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 I have such respect and admiration for that quest that you had of traveling to every 193 countries, right? Before 35, right. which is just um, thrilling and astonishing. And so part of me is like, I want to be like Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I want to travel to like, but realistically, when I think about my soul's calling, probably not that, that quest. There's probably a sure. different quest that's out there for me. So sure. how would you, what advice would you give people in terms of discerning mm. your truthful quest versus maybe a quest that, someone else thinks you should take or even like your ego is like, I want to be like Chris, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> Discerning is a good word. I like that word. Um, I, I do think it's okay to experiment. As I mentioned earlier, it's okay to like try one thing out and if it doesn't work, then try something else. Um, you know, in my case, I didn't just begin having not gone anywhere and said, okay, I want to go to 193 countries. I, I really did love travel mm -hmm. and I love different cultures. And I love being out in the world. I love being challenged. And as I, had, as I had gone to a lot of places, I worked overseas in West Africa, and th that was where the quest kind of came from. You know, it wasn't, you know, starting from nowhere. So I guess I thought about what excited me, what motivated me, and then I really liked the idea of structure. I liked the idea, of, that's where the quest kind of came in, was not just I'm going to travel, that's fine. But for me, I got even more excited because I do like lists, 
you know, I, when I started making lists of all the countries in the world and thought, okay, how many countries are there? It used to be 192. There was an extra one that got added mid, midway, you know, I had to go there. Um, and I, I just, I really love the goal setting nature of it and making it specific. So I guess I would encourage people to think about their own stuff, what excites them. You know, there's, there's a story in the book of a woman who's on, on a quest to knit 10,000 hats. Yes. Knitting is her passion. And, um, she didn't want to just knit a bunch of hats. That was kind of a key principle was like to make it specific, to make it measurable, to have the, the goal and the outcome. And I personally set the deadline of age 35, as you mentioned. Um, so I guess I would encourage people to think about all that kind of stuff and figuring out, is there a way to create some structure? And, and again, in the book, I tried to show a lot of different stories. So it doesn't have to be a travel quest. Yes. Uh, so when you mentioned like, if it doesn't work, you can hmm. try something different. How do you know when something isn't working because it's, maybe not right for you versus something that's not working and it requires a little more dedication, effort, commitment? Yeah, that's a hard one, right? That's a hard question because you don't want to just say like, well, if you're tired of doing it, you should just stop. Right. You know, I think that's terrible advice. <laughs> I, I feel like people are always like, oh, your life should be so easy. I'm like your life should not be easy. Yeah. You know, like I, I really believe in doing hard things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like doing hard things helps us grow and, and taking on challenges helps us grow. So there were lots of times that I, that I guess I was sick of, of the quest, you know, in some ways. Maybe, maybe that's an exaggeration. I don't want to say I was sick of it, but it was certainly lots of times that I would have just loved to do something else and maybe would have preferred, like, focusing on my business or being at home more or just traveling for travel's sake as opposed to trying to get to chat or something. But I guess, I was, I guess for me, is it's the long-term perspective, right? So if, if, you're, if you're struggling, you're like, is it, am I giving up? Like, think about the long term. Are you going to regret giving up, you know, or is it going to be okay? Yeah. Plenty of stuff that I've given up on that I just could not care about. It's fine, you know. But for me, for the quest, I was like, no, I've got to stick with it because I do not care what anybody else thinks. You know, this is not for anybody else's, you know, adoration or admiration. I know that I will feel bad mm -hmm. if looking back 15 years from now. I'm like, well, I went to a bunch of countries. You know, there's, there's like 193 countries in the world. And I made it to 150 and then I was done. You know, like I just, I couldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. That, and, and that sense of completion of that mm. quest was important. So when you think about, um, and it sounds like the quest of traveling to 193 countries before 35 was mm. very truthful, like very based on, you know, if you believe in the soul, it was based on your soul's calling. Mm. When you think about grad school, it sounds like there was a combo of this is kind of for me and it's also kind of because this is the way that you, um, you know, you get the piece of paper. Mm. What, did you finish grad school, I think? I did eventually, yeah. Well, I finished a master's degree, and I had thought about going on to my PhD, so thankfully I, I wisely chose not to do that, yeah. um, which if anybody's watching has a PhD, good for you. For me, it just, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, yeah, so it wasn't bad. I think, I, I'm sorry, you have a question you're coming to. Maybe let's wait for your question. Yeah, so I, the question was, um, is around, how come you finished that quest or how did you know to finish that quest when it wasn't completely truthful for you? Oh, I see. I guess there was kind of a cost benefit analysis to it yeah. and it wasn't like a soul crushing thing. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't hate it. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't really keep me from anything else at the time. Um, I think had I gone on to the PhD where that's like a five year commitment or whatever, that might've been a, a totally different situation. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, I was doing a, a master's program of about a year and a half. It was a two year program, but I kind of accelerated it and I was able to work on other stuff and it was just a good time in my life. So I guess for me, it was the cost benefit of like, I'm happy to keep going. Um, if I really hated it or, you know, for whatever reason, really wanted to do something else, then I probably would have. Did you, and I, was there anything else that you wanted to say around that, that we, could we hop back to my question, but I'm wondering, I'm curious about what else was there for you. I don't remember now, but okay. it probably wasn't terribly important. Okay. So one of the things that people often struggle with in terms of life design when, you know, they're on, they're maybe on one path and they're, they're getting ready to hop to another is letting other people down. Mm. And, um, sure. so how do you navigate the expectations of others when you're living a remarkable life? Well, that's a tough one, you know. I guess the first thing is, who are these others, right? Mm -hmm. Like, who are we talking about? Are we talking about others to whom we've made commitments and we're in relationship with? Are we talking about the generalized others, the naysayers, you know, the so-called anonymous people out there? Are we talking maybe about, like, 
you know, maybe it's like here's group one and, and this is group three. There's probably this group in the middle of like people we feel a little bit of responsibility and obligation to, but we also don't want them to run our lives. You know, I don't know. I guess I guess the answer kind of depends on which kind of group you're you're talking about. I don't know that I've always done the best job of of um, of being true to that. Yeah, I, it seems like the the most difficult group is the first, where we feel a sense of. Um, our lives are entwined with theirs, and there's sure. um, maybe responsibility or expectations um, from the people that that love us. Mm. How do you navigate that? I think it's hard. I think you have to have a lot of conversations. I think you have to have some buy-in. I think you have to understand maybe that it's okay to have an individual dream and maybe st and if you're in a relationship with people you still have you know maybe shared dreams maybe you have shared goals that you're working on together and you have your own stuff and that's okay but then as for the navigation of it i mean that's almost a practical actionable thing. that's almost like a day-to-day -day or a week-by-week -week or an ongoing kind of thing um you know but hopefully um you know I, I don't know i guess there's this there's this quote in the book that i'm thinking of that's what i was coming to there's a story of uh of a young guy named tom allen from england who left his home to like cycle the world and he's going on this bicycling trip with two of his friends and his friends eventually left and went back to England and he kind of persevered on his own and he kind of judged them a little bit you know for going back because like one of them had a girl or something and the other one just got tired and he was like oh this guy's I'm gonna keep going you know so he, he like deals with malaria in Sudan he deals with like hailstorms he gets robbed like all this crazy stuff happens and then he encounters like the biggest challenge of all he meets a girl in Armenia and falls in love, right? And then he's like, what do I do, you know? Um, and he ended up writing his, his own book about that, and I tell the story in more detail in, in The Happiness of Pursuit. Um, but it was a navigation, basically. And the quote that, that he shared, kind of the process that he went through is like, you know, can a dream have only one owner, you know? And like, it's my dream to, do, to cycle the world. Now I've met this amazing person, and she wants to cycle too, but I, I can't really tell if, it, if she just wants to be with me and that's why she wants to do it or not. And so I mean, he ended up resolving it in a, in a couple of different ways, um, but it, it's definitely a tricky thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a long answer. I'm sorry about that. No, I love, I love the long answers, right? Because it's a complicated question. And I think yeah. sometimes um, complexity is, is in service of truth. And we kind of consider all of the different ways that we can navigate something. And that makes me think about your philosophy. Um, and please correct me if I don't have this right, but it's around the idea that there's more than one way to, mm. to get to do something, to achieve there has something. To be. Right? There has to be. There has to be. So so it might not be that there's one very specific way of navigating a relationship when you're when you're designing your life the way you want it to be. Maybe there's there's multiple answers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, actually, I don't think it would be truthful to say like you, you have to do it this way and you have to like have everything shared or you have to have everything separate or I don't know. I mean, like people, people in the world answer that question in their own way, and yeah. and um, if they find something that works for them, then good for them, you know. Yeah. What I've found with a lot of the people that are are, are tuning into this is they found that they've sort of woken up, so that they've been in a dream or almost been living someone else's life, and something's happened in their life mm. where now they they can look back and they can say, "I didn't really want to do this, but I did it because of those expectations or because." Um, because I was afraid to do what I really wanted to do. So they're in this sort of emerging place. What, and it, it sounds like you've always been in that place. You didn't, <laughs> you, you just knew this from a young age that it was your calling to live a remarkable life. So I'm wondering for those people that are just emerging into this truth, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for them? I don't think I always knew it was my calling to live a remarkable life. Not that I wish to correct you, but I, I feel bad about saying that. I, I always knew I wanted to do my own thing, right? But it was a very, you know, a very kind of shallow dream, you know, in the beginning. In the beginning, it was like, I just want to do my own thing so I can do my own thing. I didn't think at all about, you know, service or anything till later. That all came later. But I guess what the advice that I would have, you know, I mean, who's qualified to offer, you know, advice on this topic? It's, it's, it's um, an interesting question. But the advice I have is, is to Think about those things that you're excited about, that that, you're, that bother you as well, not just thinking about the positive things, but also thinking about what bothers you. You know, a lot of the quests that I found, um, that I wrote about in the book, were started by people who were trying to, like, solve a global problem or address something that no one else had really addressed. Um, experimenting is good. Uh, you know, confidence comes through progress, I think. Confidence comes through experience. 
So as I said earlier, I didn't have the vision of going to every country in the world until I'd been to like 50 or close to 100 or something. Um, but I just kind of kept chipping away at, at whatever it is I was trying to, to build, and I still don't even know entirely, but I'm, I'm motivated to do it. So if, you, if, if someone has that same stirring, you know, I feel like maybe, Gemma, people come to your work um, out of a sense of longing for something more, perhaps. Yes. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's, that's true or not, but maybe that's my sense. So that's great. Great first step, right? <laughs> like raising your hand and like, I want something different from whatever it is that I'm experiencing, whatever pressures I encounter, whether it's that from group one, group two, or group three, or my own, you know, self-implied thing. Um, but I would say keep reaching for it and don't forget about it. You know, don't, don't, um, don't just kind of move on with your life, right? Because life is short. Don't just, um, don't just forget about it. Thank you. Okay. So... Everyone that's out there that's emerging into this yeah. concept of life design and living a remarkable life, definitely go check out Chris's blog. There's two manifestos on there that are, again, were peace. When I was emerging into this life, your manifestos were guides for me. So yeah. the art and the art of nonconformity is probably um, a classic place to start. As well as I think you have a, another manifesto on 279 days to overnight success, mm -hmm. which is also um, really classic. And of course, come check out the World Domination Summit in July of every year. And I will, I'll see you there and we'll Bollywood <laughs> dance together. Yeah, that's and right. Chris is always on tour with, with remarkable projects like the book, The Art of Nonconforming was your first one, $100 yeah. Startup, your second, and The Happiness of Pursuit. So definitely connect with Chris. And Chris, thank you so much for, your, for dropping your wisdom and for um, sharing your experience and, and keeping it real and just allowing us to go with the flow today. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you. Bye.